This is a 2018 Ford Mustang GT, and it's the latest Mustang, which has been updated for the 2018 model year. It looks a little different than the old one. It has a little more power than the old one. And frankly, it's just better than the old one. Oh yeah, and this one costs $53,000. That's right, 53 grand for a Mustang. And this isn't a Shelby or a Super Snake or some sort of Mustang Hellcat competitor. This is just a regular Mustang GT with a $53,000 price tag. Today, I'm gonna take you on a tour of it. Now, I've borrowed this Mustang from Ford, and I specifically wanted one with a lot of options, and this one has a lot of options. Now, the Mustang GT starts at $40,000, which means this one has $13,000 in options to get it up to its $53,000 price tag. That price tag may seem unconscionable to Ford Mustang fans, but today, I'm gonna try to explain why it isn't. The biggest reason is the Mustang lineup is just changing. A few years ago, if you wanted a cool-looking Mustang, you got the base level Mustang V6, but if you wanted a Mustang that was fun to drive, you had to step up and get the V8 powered Mustang GT because the V6 was boring and slow. Well, things have changed quite a bit since then. The V6 Mustang is gone. Now the base level Mustang is the EcoBoost. It has 310 horsepower and it does 0 to 60 in 5.3 seconds and it starts around $28,000, meaning that the base model Mustang is now fast and fun and cool looking and surprisingly cheap. And that means the GT had to get faster, and so it did. The Mustang GT is pricey now, yes, but consider this. This car makes 460 horsepower and 420 pound-feet of torque. We've moved beyond simply fun to drive and into the realm of truly high performance. This thing will do 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds with its new automatic transmission. And when you really think about it, 460 horsepower and 3.9 seconds 0 to 60 for 50 grand, suddenly it doesn't seem so crazy. And of course, there's more to it than that. So today I'm gonna to take you on a tour of a $53,000 2018 Ford Mustang GT, and I'm gonna show you all of the interesting quirks and features, and then I'm gonna get behind the wheel and drive it, and then I'm gonna give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Mustang, click the link below to visit autotrader.com oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of the most unusual and strangest Mustangs currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now I'm going to start under the hood where there are a couple of interesting quirks, one of which is badging. There's quite a lot of it under here. First off, on the plastic engine cover there's a 5.0 badge, just to remind you. Also on the bar that goes across the engine to stiffen the chassis, there's a little plaque on it that says Mustang GT with two like two inch long lines on either side of GT. I'm not really sure why. Also on the plastic engine cover it says powered by Ford on both the left and the right just in case you had some question as to what this car was powered by. The other interesting thing, under the hood, there are a lot of QR codes. They're on just about every part under the hood. I tried to use my phone to scan these QR codes, but they won't scan. My assumption is they're like proprietary QR codes for Ford, and they use them in the production line to sync up which parts have to be at a certain place at a certain time so they can be installed in a car in the factory. And next up, moving on to the windshield, where you will also see a QR code at the base of the windshield. In fact, this car has QR codes on all of its glass, which is sort of unusual. I haven't really seen that before. It's sort of an interesting insight into automotive production. Next up, moving on to the front end. Now, one of the biggest updates for 2018, the primary update to the exterior, is they slightly restyled the front end. There's been a little controversy about how this looks. Personally, I think it looks fine, similar to the old one. But I think we can all agree that the running lights look really cool. Check this out. You turn on the car, and these are the running lights that come on. They have this really cool look to them, and they're on at all times. Next, we move on to the rear of the car, where there are a couple of interesting details. One is the fuel door. You open it up, and you will find that it is capless. So there's no fuel cap to remove and place on your trunk, and then you accidentally drive away, and it falls off the car, and you lose it. It's a capless fuel filter. It's a smart idea. A lot of new Fords have this. It's not really that unusual if you already have a Ford, but it's worth mentioning if you haven't seen it before. Another interesting item is back here in the rear quarter window. There's a little decal back there that says Flat Rock Assembly Plant, where this car is built. It says world-class vehicles built by world-class people. And there's a little picture of the factory. Can you imagine if that was your job at the factory? You go into the cafeteria. Oh, so what do you do? Oh yeah, I screw in the headlights, make sure the car has headlights. What do you do? Oh yeah, I put that sticker on the 
rear quarter window at Sticker. World class people, it's me. I do the stickers. Next, we move on to the rear of the Mustang, and there are a surprising amount of quirks back here. I'm going to start with this badge in the middle in the rear. You can see it says GT. All the GTs have that, obviously. The interesting thing about that badge is all the EcoBoost models have just a horse, the Mustang logo in the middle. So, if you're ever behind a Mustang and it has the horse logo there, you know that it's an EcoBoost. Obviously, the GTs say GT. The other interesting thing about this car is the rear turn signals, which are among the coolest in the car business. They light up sequentially like a little construction sign warning you that you have to change lanes because there's a construction zone ahead. I love how these look. There's some interesting things about them. One is that when you put the hazard lights on, they don't light up sequentially. I guess they decide that novelty wears off when you're actually in a hazard, and so they just light up like normal turn signals. In front, they also just light up like normal turn signals, but you will notice that the flash is a little bit longer because it flashes for a longer period of time. That's all three of the rear signals lighting up. The front one just lights up once in that amount of time, so it's a little longer flash than a normal turn signal. Also interesting, when you're inside the car, you can actually hear that longer flash manifest. You put on the turn signal and you can hear that it just stays on a little bit longer in between clicks than a regular turn signal. Now, one of the things you might be wondering is, well, how does Ford get away with sequential turn signals? But in the Audi RS3 video I did, they couldn't have sequential turn signals. There was sort of a secondary light that also had to light up. That's because there's a federal standard about how much turn signal has to flash when you first put on your turn signal. In Audi's case, the amount of turn signal that flashes is too small to meet the standard, so they have to have that auxiliary light light up while their sequential turn signal goes on. But in Ford's case, this light lights up first, and it is large enough on its own to meet the federal turn signal surface area standard, and so Ford does the sequential turn signal without having that auxiliary light like Audi. Next up around back, we must cover a couple of interesting items that are hidden, one of which is the reverse light. It turns out the reverse light in the new Mustang is located below the license plate, below the bumper, all the way down here, you shift into reverse and it turns on. Who knew it was located down there? I certainly didn't. The other interesting hidden item back here is the trunk popper. Now you can press the key fob to open up the trunk or you stick your hand down here by the license plate where you'd never really know it's located and then it pops open and you can open up the trunk. Next up, moving on to the trunk itself, you'll find there's nothing especially interesting about it. It's reasonably large for a car like this. It's carpeted, nothing particularly interesting, but if you open up the floor of the trunk, you will find a spare tire well. However, there's no spare tire. There's just an air compressor. So if you have a flat, maybe you can try to fix it yourself. It's like they were gonna give you a spare tire and they were like, nah, we changed our minds. But here's the spare tire well to see what you could have had. Next up, moving into the interior where there's a surprise amount of quirks actually. We start with the gauge cluster. I really like the fact that if you turn on the car before you close your door, a little warning pops up that says vehicle is on. Well, thanks Ford. I really appreciate letting me know that. We're on the same page. I turned it on, so I'm glad that you're now telling me that it is on. And by the way, those warning messages are kind of interesting. Vehicle is on is rimmed in yellow. It's only a medium warning. However, certain other warnings light up in red because they're more important. For example, if you leave the door open or the hood open when your car is running, those will turn red because they're more important. They don't want you to drive away not knowing about your door. But vehicle is on is only something you sort of have to know about. Next up, we move on to the seats. Now, this car has these Recaro sport seats and they look really meaty and grippy and they do really hold you in place in corners. They're really cool. I like how they feel. I like how they look. The downside of these seats is they cost $1,600 and you can't get them power operated. So they're totally manual seats. You can't get them ventilated and you can't get them heated. So if you get these Recaro seats, you gotta really want to be gripped in place through corners because you're giving up a lot to do it. Frankly, I would rather have my butt cooled and slide around a little bit more. The next up, we move on to the center control stack. There are a couple of interesting items in here. I really like at the bottom of the center control stack these cool silver toggle switches that sort of make it look like an airplane. You have the hazard lights, traction control off. The next one tightens or loosens up the steering feel. It gives you various different steering modes. And then the one on the right is the drive mode. But regardless of what these switches do, they're just fun to press. Next up, even more interesting, next to those little levers, you can see we have the gear lever. And you can see I got a six speed manual in this car with my Recaro seats. I'm ready for serious performance. And at the base, to that shift lever, it says sync, not Mustang GT or 5.0 to really emphasize my performance, but instead it's an 
ad for the infotainment system. It seems like kind of an odd place to put that right there on the shift lever. And speaking of things that say stuff in this car, I direct your attention to the underside of the center console lid where there's a little clip and then printed right above it, it says pens. Just for those people out there who see that and say, what little cylindrical thing could I put there? Is that for my magnifying glasses? Next, we move on to the glove box. And at first glance, it seems like a fairly standard glove box. You push this little latch on the left, the glove box opens, pretty simple. But here's the interesting thing. There's a little yellow tab at the top of the glove box. You push that and there's a separate glove box for the owner's manual. Your owner's manual doesn't live in your actual glove box. It lives in its own special little cubby within the glove box. Now, speaking of the owner's manual, we got to talk about this. The owner's manual in this car is 501 pages long. How is it possible that a simple old V8 rear-wheel drive American muscle car can have a 500-page owner's manual? Well, I'll tell you how. Turn to page 196. There's an entire section about towing. And I don't mean towing the car. I mean towing with the car. In fact, there's an entire half page devoted to launching a personal watercraft with your Mustang. How do you position your Mustang to launch a boat on a boat ramp? Do you think anyone has ever even read that? No, of course not, but nonetheless, it's there. Another interesting item I find in the owner's manual is there's a long section about diagnosing problems with the voice control system. Basically, you use the voice control system, you tell it to call somebody, it isn't working, so you open up your owner's manual to page 429. My favorite issue, the Sync 3 voice control system is having trouble recognizing foreign names stored on my cell phone. And then it says the possible cause is you may not be saying the name exactly as it appears in your phone book. And it goes on to say that Sync 3 applies the phonetic pronunciation to any name in your phone book. In other words, you're trying to call your friend Juan? Well, no, now you're not. Now you're trying to call your friend Joanne, and you basically have to say that phonetically if you want SYNC 3 to pick it up. Or it gives you a different helpful hint. If you don't want to do that, you can select your contact manually. So if it simply cannot find your foreign named friend, it tells you just go in there and select it manually. It's probably easier than trying to sound out his foreign name. Next up, we move on to the gauge cluster, which for 2018 is now just one giant screen. And it has a lot of interesting quirks, one of which is the fact that it always seems to be displaying my RPMs. And I don't mean just in a tachometer way like most cars, I mean it's always giving a digital readout of my RPMs. 940, 680, 1120, 1180, 1190, 1250. I don't know why anyone would want to see this digitally, and obviously due to the nature of it, it's just always fluctuating constantly, but there it is, a digital readout of your exact RPMs. Next up, we move on to what happens to the gauge cluster when you change the drive modes. Here is the gauge cluster in normal, looks like a fairly normal normal gauge cluster, but you put it in sport and take a look at how the RPM gauge is now displayed. It sort of goes across the top. It's a cool little look, and that's sort of the benefit of a configurable gauge cluster like this. But now check what happens when I put it in track. It even becomes more aggressive and shows the RPMs in this flat line across the top. That is kind of a cool feature. It's nice to see them all change like that. Now, you may have heard the incredibly annoying beeping noise while I was revving the engine in those shots, and here's the deal with that. There's a little button on the steering wheel with a Mustang logo on it, which seems sort of cryptic at first, but you press it and it brings up all these car configurability options. One of the options is a shift tone. So you can have the car sort of light up a shift light to let you know when it's time to upshift, or it can beep at you when it's time to upshift. That is incredibly annoying, and I strongly recommend never turning it on. Now, there are several other interesting things that come up when you press that Mustang button, one of which is the exhaust note. Now, you have four different exhaust note options. You have quiet, normal, sport and track. Let's take a listen to see if it actually does anything when you change between them. Here is the exhaust in quiet. And here is the exhaust in track. Not surprisingly, it's a little louder in track, and I love the exhaust note in this car. More on that when I drive it. Now, beyond that, another interesting thing that comes up when you press the Mustang button is launch control. You can turn on launch control, and you can also set the RPMs where launch control will launch you. You can choose anything from 3,000 RPMs, which seems sufficient to me, all the way up to 5,500 RPMs if you want to do 5,500 RPM launches, you can do that. When you buy a used one of these, check where the prior owner set the launch control at. Another interesting item, it lets you choose which gauge you want to display in the middle. There's a section on gauges, and you can kind of go through them and choose. And it has all the usual stuff, air-fuel ratio, it has engine temperature. It also has my personal favorite, 
axle oil temperature, which is something that about four people in the world personally care about. And the funny thing is you can select it and then go back to your gauge cluster and you can see you have your tachometer, you have your speedometer, and then you have your axle oil temperature for all those times when that's really important to you. Next up, there's an option to change the colors you see displayed in the gauge cluster. This is kind of cool. You can go through and sort of choose between colors, ice blue, gray, green, purple, whatever, and you can see it change. But you can also change to a my color. What exactly is a my color? Well, if you scroll down in the colors menu, you can see that there is a feature called create my color. You click on it, there's a whole wheel of colors that you can create. Now, not all of them are showing up, but it's a whole wheel, I promise you. And you can see that I've chosen sort of an orange. Now, when I go back into the color selection menu, I choose my color one, the color I just chose, and look, everything is that orange that I selected. This is perfect if you have a very specific color that you want your gauge cluster to display in. Next up, moving out of the Mustang tab and into the vehicle settings tab, one interesting thing I found in here is the locks section. You can see there's an item for auto lock and auto unlock, and then there's one that says miss lock. I have no idea what that means, but if you have a 2018 Mustang, you can turn on mislock or you can turn off mislock. Now, one other item I should mention, this general vicinity, this car has adaptive cruise control. Radar cruise control will see the car in front of you and slow down or speed up depending on what it does. That is especially noteworthy because this car has a manual transmission. So you may be wondering, how does adaptive cruise work with a stick shift? Well, two interesting items. One is the moment you push in the clutch, it turns off. So if you go to upshift or downshift, it turns off and you're on your own. Adaptive cruise is no longer functional. But the thing you're probably more interested in is what happens if the car in front of you slows down to a stop? Does it push in the clutch for you? Does it downshift for you? What does it do? Well, it turns out as you start to slow down, it'll slow down for you just like adaptive cruise control should. But if you get to a point where it's just getting too slow, where your RPMs are going too low, it dings and then adaptive cruise control is shut off and you have to take over from there. Frankly, that's pretty much all we can expect from an adaptive cruise control system with a manual transmission. And to be honest, I'm glad they included it at all in stick shift cars. I think that is kind of a cool feature. Finally, in the front, we move on to the infotainment system, Ford Sync. Sync has dramatically improved since it first came out. And frankly, now it's fantastic. It's really responsive to everything. Pinch to zoom on the map is responsive. Everything you just tap, it's very responsive. Frankly, it feels like using a really good cell phone. I know Sync had some problems initially, but it's a lot better now, and I would love to have this system in my car. Next up, we must discuss the back seats. Yes, this car has back seats, and as usual, I will now climb in them. I've moved the front seat all the way forward. Ugh. And now I'm back here. If I were to put the front seat back, well, there just wouldn't be all that much room, especially if I moved it back into place. With that said, I might as well take this time to dispel an unusual rumor that always persists when I climb in the back of these cars, that car companies put rear seats in just for insurance purposes. That isn't true. No insurance company looks at this, goes 460 horsepower, rear wheel drive, stick shift, Mustang. Oh, but it has back seats. Well, then it must be a safe family car. They're not stupid. They put them here because some people want a two seat car most of the time, but they want back seats just in case they have to move around someone occasionally so they're nice to have. It's not to try to fool insurance companies who have these detailed statistical models. They're not going to be fooled because some company put extra seats in a 500 horsepower sports car. They have them here for people who actually want to use back seats. And indeed, these are usable occasionally, but frankly, based on how tight they are, I would say very occasionally. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2018 Mustang GT. Now it's time to get behind the wheel and drive it. All right, driving the new Mustang GT. And I gotta tell you, this thing's a blast. This thing is a ton of fun. I haven't really spent much time in a Mustang in ages. And uh, I've spent a lot of time in this one and I, it's so much fun. I, I thought that it would kind of be crappy and it isn't. Um, it's worth noting the interior is crappy. They're still using kind of cheap plastic just about everywhere. The dashboard and the door don't, there's no like cohesive line. They just sort of come together. There's some things that could be improved. The turn signal switches that Ford is using now are just, however, um, you know what can't be improved is like the performance per dollar for this car, which is something I never thought I would say because it costs 50 grand. But here's the thing, it's really fast. It's really a lot of fun. It handles amazingly well. It's just 
It's it just rock. It's just the best. I love driving this car. One other thing I really love about it is downshifts are such a blast and, and, sh and shifting the gears. Um, you know, in this day and age where manuals are going away, Ford has actually put some thought into this one. It's just fun to drive. Um, the, the, the clutch pedal is a little kinked, a little more than I would like. It's not quite as smooth as in some cars, but otherwise, it's good, it's predictable, the shifter is great, easy to figure out where to put it in, not notchy, just like good. Handling is really impressive, and I think that's probably the area where I'm the most surprised by this car. Uh, it handles a lot better than I was expecting. We're still not on the level, like I drove the GT350R on the old style Mustang, the pre-facelift, and that thing handles like a supercar, it's incredible. This thing is good, it's not on that level, but it's better than I would expect from a Mustang. I mean, if you haven't spent time in like a Mustang in a while and you have these old preconceptions, you might be surprised. The sound is so much fun. You hear that? I mean, that that sound is, I'm going 30, and it sounds like I'm qualifying for Le Mans. Like it's, it's, it's so loud at all our, and you can turn, put it in a quiet mode and it's not that bad. But I love, I love, the way that it sounds. <laughs> okay, I gotta turn off the shift tone. The ride is harsher. It is a harsh ride. Uh, it's not a car to drive around in the city. It's, uh, it bumps and it's rough. I'm not really like a Mustang fan. I, I, I've been kind of lucky. Nobody ever accuses me of oh, being too allied to one brand or another. I think I give pretty fair reviews to all cars. I don't really care that much about specific brands, except I like Land Rover, but I mostly just make fun of them. Um, so I'm not like a Mustang guy over a Camaro guy over a Challenger. I mean, all those cars are appealing to me, frankly. But this is impressive. It's, it's, it's better than I was expecting it would be. And um, I think that if I was choosing one of those three right now, the new Mustang driving this thing around for the last week has been like, wow, this is fun. It's actually fun. And so that's the 2018 Ford Mustang GT. Yes, this is a pricey Mustang, but it also has everything. Great styling, a great sound, excellent performance, lots of power and torque, tons of technology. Sure, it's more expensive than past Mustangs, but it's also better. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Mustang is fine, the new design is a bit controversial, and the overall look is somewhat familiar, and it gets a six out of 10. Acceleration does 0-60 to 60 in 4 seconds or less with an automatic and it gets an 8 out of 10. Handling is sharp, good sports car sharp, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Fun factor is huge, the car easily puts a smile on your face and it gets a 7 out of 10. Cool factor, however, is low. To most people it's just another Mustang, and indeed it is, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 33 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. This car has a lot of cool tech like adaptive cruise and that configurable gauge cluster, but it also misses some stuff like power seats, it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is fine, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Quality is decent, I suspect it'll be reliable enough, but the interior isn't particularly upscale, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is average for a car like this, 13.5 cubic feet of cargo space and 4 seats gives it a 4 out of 10. Finally, there's value. I know 53 grand is big money for a Mustang, but this car is just so much freaking fun, I have to give it a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 28 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is is 61 out of 100. It comes up exactly where you'd expect, short of the Z06, the GT350R, the ZL1, the Demon. It's a great performance car, but it's not on the level of those models, which are on the next echelon of performance.